Write the world-changing book that will help grow your personal brand and your business as it makes the world a better place. Welcome to the Author's Corner, hosted by Robin Colucci. Every episode, we bring you some of the most successful authors, as well as other industry experts, to share some inspiration, motivation, tactical strategy, and fun. We'll also talk about the challenges and trends in the publishing industry. Don't get stuck in the idea phase. Join the Author's Corner today. Start writing the book you've dreamed about. Hello and welcome to the Author's Corner. I'm your host, Robin Colucci, and today I have with us Dr. Jen O'Ryan. Jen is an inclusion, diversity, and equity strategist focused on helping people build authentically inclusive and welcoming companies. She brings a unique perspective to organizational change, combining a PhD in human behavior with over 20 years of experience in leading global launches of new products, as well as evaluating policy and consumer experiences. Jen understands the challenges leaders can face in developing a culture of inclusiveness for employees, clients, and customers. Jen is the author of Inclusive AF, a field guide for accidental diversity experts that she published in 2020. This book is designed for anyone who's thinking about inclusion and diversity, and it explains how to cultivate a more welcoming workplace. In today's episode, we discuss not only the need for DEI initiatives, but Jen also addresses some of the challenges of figuring out how to be an effective ally. And she gives us some pointers on just that. So relax and enjoy. So Jen, welcome to the Author's Corner. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It, it's such, I've been really excited to, to speak with you. And I'm just going to jump right in because my burning question that yes. I want, I would love, and I imagine for many of our listeners, it would be a similar question is, how did you come up with the, the label for yourself as the accidental DEI expert? I, that is a really good question. So it is, it is a term, it is a loving term of endearment. And it actually is a, a term that's fairly common in the tech industry. So I spent the first 20 years of my career working primarily in tech, uh, leading product launches and global initiatives. And the accidental expert is always the person on the team who is really good at research and will like, a need will come up. Somebody needs to learn how to use some kind of coding language or something like that, or needs to be a specialist in a visa issue. And so that person will go do some preliminary research and then all of a sudden becomes the expert accidentally on the subject, <laughs> the go-to person for everybody in the department. It's like, I heard that you're an expert in <laughs> it's like, yeah, I am because I can Google search. And so it's, it's, it's loving. And honestly, a lot of the people I talk to who work in inclusion, equity, and diversity, they got into it accidentally. Like mm. they, they, they didn't set out intentionally to do this. They saw a need and they saw a skill set that they had, and they just wanted to go out and change their part of the world. Yeah. Incredible. And so help me out also, because I was looking at your book and it says inclusive AF. I haven't heard of what AF, am I just like totally ignorant? What is AF? I okay. like to give people plausible deniability. And honestly, when you were teaming up your first question, I thought this is where you're going because it's, <laughs> it's like, what is this? What is what is the title? But uh, no, so uh, I do like to give listeners plausible deniability that they can pretend that I thought field guide was two words. It's inclusive, a field guide. Oh, guess, a field. okay. <laughs> but it also is, it is also a slang for um, as, as heck, similar uh, as heck. So basically my, my, this is a working title for my book long before it was published. And, you know, I was working on it in 2020 and everything going on. I'm like, we just can't be polite about this anymore. We have to be all in on inclusion and we need to stop having these polite conversations about it and, and just really talk in real terms. And that's where we get to the, the oh. meaningful change. Oh, I get it now. Okay. Very cool. All yeah. right. Because I was thinking, is it something like a play on AI since she's out of tech? Like I was completely going in the wrong direction. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of the other things I picked up from tech is, you know, is is using um, profanity uh, judiciously, but sometimes like um, glitter. Right, right. Yes. 
Yes. Well, perf yes. It, and it can, it can work, it, it can work very nicely as that. So yeah. But a field guide is that that's a, that's a PG version. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> so, all right now. And, and, you know, I think one of the reasons why I was so excited to have you on today to talk about diversity and inclusion, because it's something that has, I guess, always been somewhat on my radar, but really you've probably heard of hashtag publishing paid me. That really put it front and center for me because, you know, being in the publishing industry and just seeing, I mean, I already, you, you can't be in the publishing industry and not have a sense that it's not been really thoroughly diversified. Right? I mean, and necessarily equitable. Yes. And, yes. Yeah. Or, and it's definitely not necessarily equitable, but, but, you know, there were some things that I learned, you know, through reading, you know, about hashtag publishing paid me and some of the and seeing the, the actual spreadsheet and some of the details i i was i was really shocked at just how much of disparity that there was um and i mean do you find generally that when people start to really look at the issue in their particular area that that there's a similar experience or you know how how do people generally respond when they first start to encounter this topic it's it's oftentimes a lot of panic. It, it, it tends to be a very stark realization and it happens in, in a moment for the most part where somebody will realize that, you know, walking through the world, the way that you, you look and you appear, it changes drastically how your environment are, interacts with you and, and how the world, how you see yourself in the world. And honestly, it's typically somebody who's never had to think about their ideas being diminished or being talked over in a meeting or being disregarded or being assumed that you are the secretary or you are in marketing because of how you look. And so it's that it's that sudden realization and, and that clicking of empathy. It's like, I can actually see how this per person is experiencing the moment. And that would have never happened to me because the way I look. And once you see that, you can't unsee it. And it can happen in very big, powerful ways. And it can happen in you know a, a workshop where you say, instead of using he or she, use they. And then give them concrete examples of how that lands. And then they're like, oh, cringeworthy. We got to stop doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where we get some of the best external experts. Yeah. And I mean, I guess that's the thing too, because I think that right behind the realization is that awareness, at least for me, of mm -hmm. utter incompetence to actually <laughs> feel like I could even talk about it, right? With yeah. any kind of, uh, without inadvertently stepping in it and then shoving, you know, a shit covered foot right in my mouth. Yes. Um, yes. So talk to us a little bit about that, because I, I have a feeling I'm not, the, I'm not alone here. <laughs> no, no, no. And it's interesting because like it, it, it follows similar, um, similar change cycles. Um, I liken it to the stages of grief, right? You have that realization oh. and then you have that moment where you realize how many times have I done something horrible to somebody and made them feel this way, made them feel less than or othered without even knowing. And then you go through that whole existential crisis. And then the next stage is typically, I want to pick up my shield and sword and go charge up the hill and, and make all of these wrongs right. And it's not sustainable. And honestly, it can cause a lot of unintended harm to the population that they're trying to serve. Right. And so it is absolutely, it, you have to go through the process, but then it's, once you see it, you kind of own it and own being part of the solution. And that requires a lot of heavy work and a lot of really being humble and mm -hmm. humility and realizing that you don't know what that lived experience is like. And until you sit down and listen to what is the problem within that community and how you can address it, um, that's, that's really where the, the magic happens is when you sit down and actually learn how you can support rather than identifying a problem through your own world perspective, what you think is a problem, and then going in and try to fix it. Right. Or it gets really difficult. But that's one of the reasons why I think those movements like that, Publishing Paid Me, is so effective. Mm -hmm. Because it really, it resonates for people and it makes it very clear. And it's very difficult to push back and say, oh, that's not, you're, you're being hysterical, you're overreacting. Right. <laughs> Although there will always still be those people. Oh, 100% there will. Yeah. But what you need is the ambivalence. You know, my favorite, the people who are ambivalent that have never had to think about it because those people, we can have a conversation. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. 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 And once they see it and you hear them and you respect their, their, pers you know, it becomes a conversation mm -hmm. and then you just kind of bring them slowly over. <laughs> yeah. And I see, I feel like that has to be a cultivated skill set. 
right? Even that, just to be able to have a conversation with someone who doesn't see it, doesn't want to see it necessarily, and then actually help them see it and then get them to the point where they could actually agree that maybe something needs to change. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons where publishing is a little bit more specific because it is so ingrained. We are so hung up on the rules of grammar and the rules of a cohesive narrative and, and, this, and the way that a story is told. And when we have something that disrupts that, people don't know what to do with it. And I think that's one of the reasons why it is really important to amplify those voices and amplify those different stories that either aren't, not, aren't told broadly or are told through the lens of somebody who doesn't have the lived experience. Yeah, and I, th I think another thing that I'm really noticing is that we need to also, you know, I, I, how do I put this? I think that publishers, even the publishers that are recognizing that we need to amplify these underrepresented voices still have in their minds like a limit, like, oh, well, we're already doing a book on injustice in this particular area. So we've got that covered this year. And it's like, nobody ever says that about business books for white guys, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, those are never yeah. enough of those. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. We got, we got to build bigger shelves for that. No, and but, it's exactly that because it seemed like a, it seems like a favor, like they should be, you know, whoever the right. is being published should just be, oh, I'm, I'm, I've been elevated to the status of everybody else. And it's like, no, we shouldn't look at it that way. Yeah. And that, yeah. that is really difficult too, because it's also, it's a scarcity mentality and right. it's, it's not an erasure. Like I do so much work around the experience of gender and, and orientation, and it's not an erasure. We're building a stage that's big enough for everybody. Mm hmm and that's oftentimes how I have to position the work that I, I do with publishers around inclusive reading is that it's, you're enhancing it. You're, you're enhancing your message and you're making it available to a broader audience. And it's, it is interesting to me because I've worked across different industries in the IND work and like some of the, some of the industries that in my perspective would be more conservative, slower to move, like the financial uh, wealth management industry, light years ahead. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. Yes. And largely because their clients are transitioning, their clients have a kiddo or family member who's gender diverse, and that builds that empathy and they come to them with questions and the industry has to adjust. And I don't know that that really has landed as broadly with publishing as far as it, bringing in these different worldviews and different, different types of telling stories. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because publishing, I think, views itself as a vehicle for social change, right? I think that, and, and it has been, Right. And I think that publishing views itself as as helping to move the conversation forward and open our minds to new ideas. And I think that that's something that is that the industry values. And at the same time, I also have detected these kind of arbitrary limitations in, in the minds of editors and publishers yeah. of, you know, how many books we can do on a particular issue. Yeah. And how to categorize them. Right. Like, like the work that I put together, is that um, for inclusion diversity experts? Is it for a healthy, functional workplace? Like there's a lot of different ways that that could be looked at. And so when we are looking at all these different voices, there is a tendency to kind of put them into silos, put them mm -hmm. into strict categories where it's like, no, there's an underlying thread that is valuable for so many different people here. Right, right. It's not like the only readers are gonna be the people who are impacted. There's a lot of people involved. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of people that are being underrepresented because they don't buy on a large internet book selling reach or platform. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> publicly traded. I think we all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. And it is, it is interesting because it is, it's that ability to take in new information and new ideas. And that level of innovation is always going to be the differentiator between the more established, really slow to move publishing mm -hmm. houses and the smaller ones that can see that immediate potential. Yeah. And I mean, and, and, and in fairness to the big five, they all have moved more in the last year, year and a half than they have in probably the 30 years prior, I think, in terms of um, they, they, they've all employed different initiatives, but they've all done something, um, which is encouraging. And I, I can still see plenty of room for uh, improvement, which I, I believe they probably can as well. Um, so when you are working with, like, so you, so tell me a little bit more about your work and, you know, what, the, what role you play in helping to further uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in, in, 
in the world, in the workplace? I mean, tell us more about what you do. Yeah, so my company initially started out, I started it five years ago, and it was because having spent so much time navigating the corporate space and learning how to figure out, you know, how to launch safely and effectively, um, I saw companies that were really struggling with their IND initiatives and really getting a handle on how does this isn't a separate thing that lives in HR that is separate from our values and separate from our organizational health, right? They all go in together. And so what I do is I come in and I help them get from that really good aspirational goal, or maybe they don't even know where to start. Maybe it's just mm. the level setting of what does diversity even mean to you as, as an individual human and as an organization and really helping them align that, even if it's just a two sentence narrative of what it is. And then from that, it builds out all the other places that IND can be infused into the organization, which sounds like a lot of jargon and buzzwords, but effectively IND isn't just a thing that lives on a shelf. It right. touches every single point in the life cycle of every employee, client, consumer, everybody. And if you lose them at one stage along the way, you've lost them forever. Ah. So it has to be part of that planning. And so um, a lot of it is coaching, counseling, educating, but then the underlying thing is, okay, but how do we actually get your initiatives off the ground? Because it's not just one program that you're going to launch. It's not a six-week unconscious bias course that your executives are going to take, and then it'll just work itself out. Right. How much do you invest in your research and development? That's how much you should be investing in your IND <laughs> because it's not ever done. And so that's that's what I do is um, you just have very real conversations about you, you, it's, your organization is a collection of humans, whether it's eight or 80,000, mm -hmm. and they will organize themselves based on the written and unwritten rules that they see. And that's where you change. That's where you get the change. So you were saying uh, just a minute ago, so like if, if, if it falls down in one point, it's going to just completely fall down. Can you give us a good example of, of what that looks like? Oh, yeah. actually, let me get out my Rolodex. No. No, my all time favorite example was, um, or still is, uh, it was, a, it was an, a new app that was being launched. And so knowing how these schedules go, right, there's a period of market research and, you know, proof of concept and then beta testing and then development and then marketing and all the outreach and everything. And in all of this huge, what must have been a 12 to 18 month initiative before it launched, there was one little tiny aspect of their app that had been outsourced to a third party. And part of the onboarding was the listing uh, gender and they had male, oh. female and other. Ah, and it, I know, right? It, it doesn't sound like a big deal in the midst of all this storm of everything else that had happened. But when I actually show that to a client and I'm like, here's a snapshot of what your end user sees that they are picking male, female, other humans aren't other. Yeah, they're never other. And no matter what your marketing slogan is, no matter what your recruiting team is telling <laughs> people, they're going to see that other and they're going to oh, roll their eyes and they're going to swipe left or whatever it is they do with the app and they're going to move on with their life. And you will never know. And so yeah. it's all those tiny points at which I mean, who, um, who would check the box other nobody, nobody, nobody's other. So yeah. Right. <laughs> and then, and then things like that are really, really subtle and a little bit more insidious in my opinion, where they have like a women's health icon will be a pregnant human with long flowing hair standing in a garden. Like that's not women's health. <laughs> we could get into all the humans get pregnant and all the things and, but I will just leave it at that. Anyway, yeah. those are two of my favorite examples. And the thing is, is that, again, in the big picture of setting up your new health and wellness program for your employees, that little tiny icon isn't even a blip on the radar. Right. But that's what your end user is going to see. And that's all they're going to see. And mm -hmm. it's going to tell them everything they need to know about working with you. Yeah, interesting. And this, when you say the end user, I mean, we're not just talking about the customers. We're talking about your, your employees, your team, mm -hmm. potential partners. I mean, everyone's going to see it, right? Everybody, yeah. No pressure, but everybody is going to see that. <laughs> yeah. Now, when, is, when, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, but that, that's again, like once you see it, you can't unsee it. Right. And so this isn't something that I have to review with people every single time. Once they see it, though, we'll start looking for it. And once they start looking for it, it becomes very evident. And then that just changes their entire philosophy and their strategy to go to market. Yeah. So when you, um, you must get pushback. Yes. Right. Like what, what's the, what's the number one objection to even, right? There's almost, there's always gotta be some eel in the organization, right? <laughs> it's gonna be like, 
Can I use that as a working title for my next book? <laughs> um, that is fantastic. Uh, you know, there always is. And that, that's the thing. It's, and another reason that I called the book what I did, because I, it's always, wow, that sounds expensive. That is the number one. <laughs> oh, very, there you go. <laughs> very, and I'm like, yeah, I bet it does. I bet that sounds horribly expensive. You know what else is expensive going out of business? Not <laughs> which they won't necessarily, right? But no, the other thing that I get is that, oh, we've got a DEI team. Or we've oh. got an HR team. And we've got it all figured out. We're oh. on the West Coast and we just all have it figured out. And there's no problem. And I'm like, it's never figured out. I don't have it figured out. Nobody has it figured out because it's constantly changing and we're dealing with humans and humans are notoriously messy. Right. And so, yeah, it's, it's, if you take your thumb off the pulse, you've lost it. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody likes change until it impacts them, but the people who really get it, the companies who really say, I don't know what else to do here. Let's partner and, and develop something really cool. They, they see the change and they see the value. And that's where, people tend to go. Yeah. I mean, I, I wrote an article about why uh, DE and I is good for publishing and I got a little pushback from some of my subscribers. This is probably, I don't even know if you end up talking to people at this level, but <laughs> you know, they, they was like, well, they should start their own publishing company <laughs> if they want to publish more of their books. Yes. That's a lot of days in there. Right. A lot of so I'm curious, what would you say to that? <laughs> then I'm going to measure it in my mind about what, guess what I said. <laughs> uh, it depends. See, now I have the time to think about Without it. Without necessarily <laughs> adding glitter. <laughs> you know, if I was standing in a coffee shop and that just like occurred spontaneously, it would be a very different response than what you're going to get now. But uh, exactly. Just, like, <laughs> I, I, had to, I had to calm myself down first too. But anyway, go on. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the thing too, because nobody, you don't, you don't gain any ground by telling somebody that everything they fundamentally believe is wrong. Exactly. I don't like that. I wonder. Yeah. Oh, and then, <laughs> but, um, so it typically what I do is that, you know, is that part of your inclusion or your diversity initiative? Like mm -hmm. if we're bringing up voices, like what is the role and the core value of this publishing house or this company organization? So we were talking about how do you respond to somebody Yes. who basically has this, this blanket attitude, like it's not my problem, it's their yeah. problem and they should go solve it themselves. So I'm ready when you are. Totally ready. <laughs> okay, so please tell me, how, what is a great response to that kind of a thing? Well, I mean, it's always it, it's always a balance, right? Because my go-to is is educating, but it's also coming from a place of curiosity. So oftentimes if it's a situation where I can ask them to talk more about it, it gets, it gets the process started because it's really an automatic response to kind of dig in your heels and say, nope, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. And once you make it more conversational and they feel like they can actually talk about what it is they feel and why they feel that way, then that opens up the door to say, well, yes, but what's the core value of the organization? If it's a publishing house, what are our core values? Amplifying new voices, fantastic. Here's how that ties in. And, and making it more of a, a logical connection rather than an emotionally charged argument where a table gets flipped over or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, I, what I, what I find challenging is it's not even necessarily talking to people in the publishing industry. I think it's more the people on the sidelines mm -hmm. um, who just have an opinion, but, <laughs> and it might be like, okay, well, they're not involved, but on the other hand, I feel like if there's this sort of pervasive attitude about efforts around diversity and inclusion that, you know, is either stated or unstated, but definitely exists, you know, how do we cope with that in, in this increasingly polarized society that we have? And this, this is really a, a sore point, I think, just generally in our society. So give us a little bit more insight into that, because I feel like that's something that any of us are likely to encounter on any day of the week. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so I always look at it like it's a spectrum, right? So on one end, we have the people who are advocates, champions, accidental diversity experts. They are hundred percent on board. They're, they're ready and they're educated and they're doing the work. And I can geek out with those individuals all day long, but that's not going to get us any change, right? So the other end of that spectrum is the people who are resistant, either resistant to change, resistant to IND, myriad reasons. They're just unable to take in new information. Um, and then there's a huge amount of people in the middle. 
And so those ones in the middle, if we can create a place where people can express a different opinion, express a different way of thinking, not to the point that it's toxic and damaging and we all know those individuals, right? Um, <laughs> not to that level, but just an open discourse. I can have a conversation. And I had an epiphany one time when I was at a coffee shop talking to somebody that we had bonded over coffee, our mutual love of coffee, told a stranger, right? And then all of a sudden we were on completely different sides of every possible measurable aspect except coffee. And <laughs> it started getting a little tense. And I realized I'm like, this person is experiencing me saying, how on earth can you believe that? And I am looking back at them saying, how on earth could you believe that? It's so obvious. And in that moment, I realized it's everything we've ever been told since we were brought home from the hospital. Right. That shapes our understanding of what the truth is. And once you connect in a human way and kind of peel that back, it opens up the doors to more conversations. And it's, it's those, when I say small incremental changes, I'm a huge fan of those. Small incremental doesn't mean not meaningful and not impactful. You can make small changes, like opening up the door to somebody who might consider things differently in the future or might view something a different way. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we get that gravitational pull right. and that societal change. But part of that has to be that we have, we have representation. I mean, it's like marriage equality, right? When, when marriage equality first became a thing in, in California, got so much publicity and generalization is forthcoming. But generally speaking, that was the first real exposure that a lot of people, uh, where the, the LGBTQ plus community, community is largely closeted, uh, that could have been the first time that they actually saw gay couples getting married. Right. And it wasn't something scandalous. It was, you know, it Bob from the marketing department is marrying his partner of, of 30 years and they just wanna file taxes together and be there until the end. Um, and it, it really changed. For a lot of people what that looked like and what it felt like and it wasn't as scary anymore and so mm -hmm. I think those are the conversations and that's the approach I try to take not 100 percent it's it's I have my moments and <laughs> I can be blindsided and I have my own limitations as well sure. um, and so th that's why I say that this is part of the journey though and nobody's got it figured out yeah yeah and I think I think you're right about you know maybe maybe a big a big factor is just not expecting someone to completely do a 180 in one conversation, right? And to recognize that it's it's a process of like peeling back the different layers and inviting someone to think differently about even a little thing that is just a tiny piece of the picture mm -hmm. can, or just even not even suggesting that they think differently, but just to share a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes what that, how that happens or the series of events that leads up to that is somebody who has access that somebody else doesn't. And mm -hmm. that person with the access stand up and says, what you're saying is not okay. Mm -hmm. and, and, and doing something about it in the moment. Um, the balance there is making sure that they aren't doing something that is gonna put somebody else in harm later down the road. But yeah. it, standing up when you see somebody who's being dismissed or talked over, interrupting it in the moment, if you have access to that. Yeah. Yeah, it seems we are very much have a tendency. If you look like me, you probably think like me. And I'm curious to see if you've had a similar experience, but I've had people just say horribly offensive things to me in, in airports or <laughs> right. in my movie theater because they're just like, oh, you look like me. You must think like me. And I'm like, how are you saying this to a perfect stranger with your face? Like, you're actually saying this. And then, like, right. <laughs> again, they're like, if you look like me, you think like me, but you interrupt that and it just gives that flash like a like a shock to the system of oh wait not everybody thinks like me and it's not going to change everything they believe but it's a it's a stop and it, if it prevents them saying something horrible in front of other people take the win right because <laughs> the curly head woman freaked out and started shouting at them yeah no kid i'm think i just when you were sharing it just reminded me and i i almost don't even want to tell the story because i don't want it to seem like i'm like aren't i great <laughs> you know but but I, I remember when I was in high school, and I really hadn't thought of this story in probably 40 years, but I was in high school and we were in a speech class and it was a mostly white high school. And there was a, you know, a black young man, it was, it was in my class and, and we had, and the, the assignment was we had to teach someone how to do something, you know, and that was a form of speech. So that was the assignment. And so he took us down to the gym and he explained how to do a free throw. 
And the teacher like lambasted him and said, I couldn't understand what you're saying. You did not explain how to do a free throw. And you know, this is terrible. And I just raised my hand and I said, excuse me. I said, I think he did a great job <laughs> of explaining how to do a free throw. She goes, really? Then do one. And I did. And I made the basket. <laughs> See, that's what I'm talking about. And you might not ever change that teacher's mind, but the other people in the class are going to look at that and say, I need to write that down because I'm saying that next time. And then they go out to the universe and they do it. I mean, that's, you know, as much as we, as much as we talk about this and I like to make it really accessible and, and, and easy for people to talk about because we're all thinking about it. We just need to learn how to talk about it and how to interact with each other in authentic ways. But it is exhausting to be that one person in the class, the one like it, it's exhausting, and especially if it's it's a non-observable diversity uh, human, um, the the compartmentalizing, right? Having yeah. to be in the closet at work because you can't be out safely because you might get fired, and now you're working from home, and now you have to move all the pictures and everything. Right. That, but imagine if all yeah. of that exhaustion yeah. and all that having to prove it was channeled into creative innovation, all that energy focused into right. anything. <laughs> But the minute I had to stop worrying about worrying about what shoes I had on, all of the <laughs> time to get, I can do things now that are creative. And if I want to put cute shoes on, I can. Right. But that's where I go. That's why I really drive home and feel like this is my calling to help people make their organizations more inclusive because it's better for humans and it's better for innovations, better for your ROI, it's better for your retention. People are more engaged. It's just every measurable thing is better. Yeah. And, and part of the, org and, and, you know, really in schools is, is a really important place. I mean, this is where so many expectations, like you were saying, when you're talking about how our worldviews are formed by everything that we see and are exposed to from birth. And, you know, there's so much going on, you know, on so many opportunities when someone's going through their educational experience, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you're, you're never going to be out of work. <laughs> I do. I do notice that it is changing though. I know that the, I've noticed that the work that I'm being asked to do is changing in 20, 2017, 2018. It was a lot. People had questions about gender and the experience of gender and lots of factors going into that. But yeah, everybody I talked to was like, please come in. Just let me ask you embarrassing questions. <laughs> I'm like, they're not embarrassing. Don't be embarrassed. But, <laughs> but it really was that educational component. And I, people still struggle with it. There's still a lot of confusion about the nuance. But yeah, now I'm getting a lot of questions on, okay, we're going to return to work. How do we, how does, how does that go? Mm. Right. How do we develop, uh, how do we continue to in include um, diverse talent and diverse perspectives if everybody's coming back to the office? And so it's, mm. it's just interesting to see how much of that has shifted. And of course, you know, 2020, that was all the uncertainty and chaos and, and racial and social justice. But uh, yeah, it is interesting to see. I will never be out of a job, but, uh, but it is interesting to see how it evolves and how people start to understand and, and stop asking those questions to start asking new ones. That's a good start. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I was curious when you mentioned the pandemic, did you find, and people working remotely, it sounds like maybe it forwarded the conversation a bit with that, or what is, what is the, what is the concern about going back? Cause I was, I was detecting like, maybe there's a concern of losing ground or something like that when you go back or how do we keep going forward when we go back? I mean, was there something about the remote work that made this, that helped facilitate this in some way? I'm, I'm just curious about that. Yeah. In a couple of different ways, I think. So for one, it opened up an entire pool of talented humans who've been largely ignored or excluded because they couldn't physically get into an office eight to five, oh. right? They've got mobility issues, uh, depression, anxiety, mental health, PTSD, all these different things, uh, neurodiverse humans, people with ADD, it's, it's, there's so many different things that make it hard to do your best work and be creative. And in eight to five with under floor, human beings were not meant to sit under fluorescent lights for eight hours at an uncomfortable. Eight? Yes. I that those suck the life out of me. I can't do it. Yes. Yeah, I know. I was talking to a colleague and I'm like, you think Zoom fatigue is bad? That's because you've forgotten what it's like to sit in a dinner <laughs> planning meeting. <laughs> right. Not be able to go to the bathroom. Right. People will judge you for oh. having biology. But the other side of that is that 
uh, I did a lot of work when when things really, I, as I mentioned, I'm from Seattle, and uh, a lot of tech companies had the the ability and the benefit to be able to send everybody home. Right. right? Do you work remotely? Sure. Figure it out. Sure, and sure. what that did was it introduced a lot of work into one's home. And so I mentioned about the LGBTQ plus community. So if I have pictures of my family and I'm not out at work, now I'm having to go through my home. And there was actually a term for it, straightening up the house. <laughs> removing pride flags, removing anything that could be considered controversial. Right. And it's like, that's, it, God, that's my own house now that I'm having to do. And yeah. all the microaggressions, right? All the, all the slights and can I touch your hair and uh, horrible looks and everything else that, that people no longer have to deal with. Right, right. And, and so I think that's where it's going to be a really interesting switch to see because there's also people who absolutely want to come back to the office for myriad reasons. And, and so it's going to be interesting to see how that all plays out. But I, I'm really, I'm really, really favoring the companies that take a more individualistic, we're going to filter this through inclusion yeah. and diversity and our core values as we bring people back. And science, yeah. also science. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and science. Both <laughs> science. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, I think that that is, um, and you know, and, and how, and let's just also, because another phenomenon is a shortage of workers. Mm -hmm. How do you think that, in, in what ways would you say that issues with diversity, equity, and inclusion are impacting the worker shortage? I, I, I think, and this is just speculation, I, I think that the individuals who are at that stage where they're just like, I'm not going back into an office, I will either find something on my own, I will continue to freelance because I've had to find a way to do it for the last year and a half. I think that's opened up a lot of things of here's, here's alternatives that are possible. Mm -hmm. And people will stay where they're valued as, as a human and as a contributor, and they're given cool things to work on and it meets their needs. If that's not the environment, and there's a viable option somewhere else, even if that viable option is more risky, people will take it. Yeah. Um, and so I honestly think that that's just like, they don't have as much to lose. It's almost like when, like my 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 father had a, had a pension. Yeah, and right. Then, yeah, you're right. Yeah, in my generation, it was all, all about- What? It. <laughs> all my generation, it's all about 401k. Nobody had it, nobody stayed in a career, you know, especially as a consultant. It's like two to five years max. And so that has entirely shifted. And I see the more, a uh, little bit older, more hierarchical companies saying, it just makes sense to come back to the office. And the people who aren't from that generational cohort necessarily are saying, I don't need to do anything. But here's what I think people aren't considering yet, and they should be, is this generation who is in the fifth, sixth, seventh grade, and for the last two years, didn't go to school and didn't have that. <laughs> And I'm not saying this is it. I'm not saying this is a value judgment. It's not a good right. or bad. It's just an environmental change from a scientific perspective. That socialization has been disrupted from the way that it was done in previous generations. Mm -hmm. And so people who are looking at the workplace model now need to start predicting for these kiddos who are going to start graduating university and graduating apprenticeships and, and getting into the workforce and have an entirely different mind map than any of us could ever predicted. Mm -hmm. A good point. Good point. I mean, even um, just being raised with an internet, right? Significant shifts in attitudes, expectations, and behaviors. Mm -hmm. And all those different neural patterns. Yeah, it's really going to be interesting to watch. I, I would love to have somebody do a longitudinal study, full ethics review, IRB. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But <laughs> longitudinal studies on the kiddos who, you know, we're, we're, 12 to 18 months old when the lockdown happened and didn't ever have a play date. Right. Until they were four. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. I mean, it is, you know, I found that kids, I have two kids that are now grown, but, you know, but I just find them to be so much savvier and more aware of the world. And frankly, my best teacher on DE and I has been my daughter. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. Thank, thank god for her i'd really be upside down you know oh that's fantastic <laughs> i mean do you find the younger generations seem to be i mean this, is, this almost seems like a silly question but i mean it seems to me that the that the younger generations generally are more you know woke 
to these kinds of things. Do you think the internet has something to do with it? Or what do you, what do you, why do you think that they're more, they just seemed so on top of it, you know, like way before anyone in, you know, 20 years older than them, but like we, we've been left in the dust. We're just trying to catch up. <laughs> we're, I'm still trying to figure out the Snapchats. I'm not going to lie. I don't. Right. I don't <laughs> Fundamentally, I get how it works, but that's going to be my kryptonite. But no, I think it has everything to do with the fact that they grew up with a computer in their pocket, right? Um, and, you know, when I was coming up, I it was a, a range of encyclopedias and you had to go find A through K and then you had to go find it. And it was already years out of date by the time I was even looking. Right. right? Exactly. And, they have that. and so they've got this expanded global library and access to people around the world that are part of their community. Yeah. And, and I think that just, that it just, it, it just, the way that our mind works is very, very different. Yeah. So, I mean, to them, right. And they've already met people from different mm -hmm. countries and different cultures and, and already been exposed to so many other ideas and, and cultures. Yeah. And, exactly. Uh, like if we go back to the talking about everything we've learned since we were born. So, so you have your family of origin or whatever that, that, that circle looks like. And as kids go out into the world, more into the community, and then eventually into school or something like that, everything that they pick up from that extended environment, either confirm or refutes what they've grown up as the truth at home. Right. And I think when you've got that element of this immediate access to everything, then they're having those exchanges and they're having those, you know, discussions around what is capital truth on a much higher level than we ever were. Oh right? yeah, for yeah. sure. For sure. So do you think that means that there's hope for humanity, for humans? I do, I do, but it's it's the equal and opposite reaction, right? So um, so I, I I do a lot of work specializing in the LGBTQ plus community. And we were seeing so glad does a study every two years, I believe. Um, and it shows the the progression of of tolerance and acceptance for LGBTQ plus, and there's a very extensive methodology around it. And for the first time ever, this last year, 2019 data, they saw a decline in the rates of acceptance among youth, uh, primarily in, uh, around um, non LGBTQ plus male identified youth. And it goes back to that very same thing: the the conversations that people are having around their their dining tables and their their living rooms aren't always the same and aren't always yeah well i mean and there's always backlash after progress right I exactly mean, exactly was that there was that crazy theory that when we finally got a black president that racism was over i mean hello yeah well we've got it all figured out in seattle just ask anybody <laughs> i'm getting <it's> like, <laughs> <laughs> but it is, you know, and it's that it's that equal and opposite reaction. It always pulls back um, and then it, it goes the other way. And so I do I do have a lot of faith. I do have a lot of confidence. Um, and the kiddos, you know, are just out there doing amazing things. What I need and what I think we really need to focus on is giving them that platform and giving them that visibility and giving them, you know, making it accessible to them so that they can see themselves as part of this larger solution. Yeah, lovely. All right. Well, this has been so informative and I, I so appreciate your coming today to share. Uh, I always like to end my interviews with what's what's a question I should have asked or that you would have liked me to ask that I missed. <laughs> I am at a loss for words. I can't think of anything. Who does your hair? I don't know. I know I, I have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have nothing, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, what's going to happen is I'm going to be driving uh, later on this afternoon. I'll be like, oh, why did they say this? But, Always. That's, oh, that's, yeah, you know, I got, yeah, I got nothing. But um, the one, the one thing that I would do is if, if the question was, what advice do you have for anybody out there who is, mm -hmm. feels that they are at risk of becoming an accidental uh, diversity expert, I would absolutely say never underestimate your ability to change the universe. You are not just one person, you are one person, but you can make change in people's lives that you will never meet just by saying something, modeling behavior in a grocery store while you're at line at the bank, people are watching and, and you, your, your impact to make change is not limited by your budget or how big your team is. See, it's always worth it to ask that question. Jen, thank you so much for being here with us today on the Author's Corner. Thank you so much. I have enjoyed this tremendously.
Thank you for tuning in to another amazing episode of The Author's Corner. You're one step closer to writing the world-changing book you've dreamed about for years. To access today's show notes and other helpful resources, simply visit our website at theauthorscorner.com. A positive review would be appreciated. Until next time.